Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Broadway, and I'm here to talk about this mouthful of a title, which is not my title. It was something that an Amazon person put there to get as many buzzwords into it as possible. Um, basically, it's, it's how does HomeAway manage uh, all of the images that appear on our public websites. Um, so I'm a principal architect at HomeAway, uh, which is now part of Expedia. Uh, my main focus is on things like content, uh, media, obviously, which is what I'm talking about today, uh, identity, authentication, and pretty much anything that's not either user interface facing or payment related. So I worry about the rest of it. Uh, I'm a recovering startup junkie. Uh, HomeAway was my seventh pre-IPO company. Um, the fact that I'm still working means that I didn't ever get into a pre-IPO company that was successful <laughs> at the right time. Now, HomeAway has put my kids through college, but it hasn't allowed me to retire. Um, I've been designing and writing software for about 40 years. If you count the Fortran class I took in my first year of college, it's over 40 years, but it doesn't really count. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, why HomeAway needed a photo storage system, a new photo storage system, um, how we met that need using Amazon uh, serverless, and uh, the best practices that we learned along the way. Uh, I have to say that uh, in, in my internal talk, I could use a photograph of moldy cheese. Uh, I can't use that here because I don't own the, the rights to use the image. But the shelf life of a talk like this is pretty short. I almost guarantee that tomorrow or the day after, somebody is going to say something during the keynote that supersedes what I say today or invalidates it. So just when you look at these slides in a month's time, take them with a pinch of salt and check that the, the ground hasn't changed under you since then. Talking about HomeAway, HomeAway is a, a vacation rental marketplace. It's a place where travelers can go find somewhere to stay and where owners and property managers can advertise their properties. We have two million different unique places that you can stay at uh, all around the world. Uh, in the United States, uh, I was in one in Barcelona about a month ago. Um, you name it, we've, we've got plenty of them. We have a lot of photos. Uh, we've got, like this main central image here, we've got what we call hero images, the big splashy images about a destination. And then we have property images. And each property can now have, uh, up until about a month or two ago, it was 25 images each. Now we're saying 50 images each. So uh, the math is a lot of photos. How many? We get 6 million images uploaded every month. We have to process that into all sorts of different sizes. That's five terabytes a month. Uh, 80 million unique originals today, but obviously we're growing rapidly. Of those original images, we end up producing everything from thumbnails to uh, 1920 wide landscape images. We end up with treatments or derivatives of about 1.5 billion images that we serve up to the internet. In the past, uh, and actually still operating today in parallel. Uh, in our Austin data center, we have a farm of Java application servers that are doing this image processing. Uh, they were implemented nine years ago. Uh, the design goals that they had were very different. Our design goals nine years ago were, we had bought 10 or 15 companies that were in this space. We had to make sure that we could support all the image sizes that those 10 or 15 companies had produced. Those companies had been in business since the late 90s. So they considered a, a 1024 wide image to be high resolution. And that's not the case today. Uh, in our Austin data center, all of these images are stored on uh, a NAS, a network attached storage. It's expensive storage, runs about five grand a terabyte fully loaded cost. So I uh, went through that a bit fast. Uh, yes, yeah, so $5,000 a terabyte is our cost in the Austin data center, uh, which just on this space alone is running us $25,000 a month. Um, and as I mentioned, 10 years ago, 1024, and certainly 15 years ago, 1024 was high resolution. Uh, it's sad, but most of the images on our website are four by three aspect ratio, because 10 years ago, we all had CRT monitors on our desks not 1920 LCD panels. Um, 
Another issue that we would face is that the upload rate varies enormously. Uh, for some reason, Saturday morning is a popular time to do image uploads. I think that we have some property managers who manage large number of properties that refresh their content every Saturday morning. It's also when a lot of our individual property owners will go, this takes some time. They don't want to do it on Monday evening or Thursday evening. They want to do it on Saturday morning. It's one of their weekend chores. So um, 12 o'clock Austin time, central time, is our peak traffic in the week. Uh, and with, this was a week in March of 2016, uh, early in the development of the system that I'm going to describe to you. And this was the, the traffic we were seeing then. 36 hours later, at 1 o'clock in the morning, it's not 25, uh, 9 images a second, it's one image every 25 seconds. Now, we had to have enough hardware to allow for unusual peaks, so we had hardware to handle um, 20 images per second, but most of the time that hardware is doing nothing. Yeah, 225 to 1 load ratio. And then if you look at all of these individual spikes, these are doubling and tripling of load over the space of 20 or 30 minutes. Um, it, this, is exact, this is one of the best use cases for lambdas, where you have a very highly elastic load and you don't want to be having idle hardware sitting around doing nothing most of the time. Um, so why did we switch to, to uh, AWS serverless? AWS Lambdas give us the extreme uh, scalability that we need. S3 storage gives us cheap storage. Uh, a terabyte of S3 storage, we can have that for 14 years for the price of one terabyte that we're paying for today. So it's much cheaper for us to store in S3. We're using DynamoDB for storing our metadata about descriptions of the images. Uh, and we get the benefit of Amazon being in multiple regions. For us, we're fronted by a CDN, so it's not about how do we distribute our images around the world. The CDN takes care of that, but it's about how we can be highly available. What happens if uh, our Austin servers go, if our Austin data link goes down, what do we do? We can't serve any new images. So with a multi-region uh, architecture, we can handle that with AWS Lambdas. I'm going to do a very, very quick introduction to, to lambdas. Uh, this is a 300-level talk, so most of you probably know what they are already. Um, as you know, they're a single piece of function code, no threads to manage. The really nice thing is there's no server patching to do, um, fine grain scaling. You only pay for what you use. Uh, this, this pretty much comes off the Amazon website, so you don't need to worry about capturing this slide. Um, a point that I missed off here is resilience. With a classic web server serving up images, if you have a bug that means every 10,000 images or 100,000 images, you lose a thread, a request thread gets stuck, or you've got a memory leak, over time that server degrades and eventually fails you. Uh, with lambdas, if that happens inside a lambda, it's not your problem. That lambda is going to fail eventually, perhaps, but Amazon will take care of taking that one out of the loop, and you don't have to do anything to recover from server failures. This is a trivial uh, JavaScript example of a, la a lambda. This one takes, uh, receives an SNS message, a simple notification service message, and logs the content of that message to CloudWatch. This is a terrible use of lambdas. Uh, it, it just illustrates how simple it is to write them. You don't have to know anything about SNS. You just write this function, tell Amazon, hey, this function exists, and tell it what topic it's going to be listening to, and the SNS mentions, messages will get processed. Um, this is an example of something that could be very expensive to do with lambdas. You pay only for what you use, but you pay in increments of 100 milliseconds. This lambda will execute in about two milliseconds. So if you were executing 100 of these a second, you're going to be paying for an awful lot of CPU time. You're paying for 100 milliseconds for each one, times 100. You're paying for, what, um, 100 seconds, 10 seconds? You're paying for a lot of CPU time uh, that you don't need to. So think about what your use case is. If you're going to run one of these once an hour, 
then this is a great use of lambda. If you're running one of these 100 times a second, this is a very bad use of a lambda because it's, it's going to cost you so much at that. It runs in two milliseconds, but you get, uh, you get charged for 100 milliseconds. This lambda, which you won't be able to read from the back of the room, uh, which is a good thing because it's one of our uh, Otis lambdas, I've taken out all the comments, I've taken out the logging so that it will fit on one page. This lambda takes about two and a half to three seconds to run. So the 100 millisecond round, it's just a rounding error. Uh, we don't, we're not worried about that. Uh, it's a slight cheat on this lambda. This one is responding to, uh, again, which one is this? Yeah, this one is again responding to an SNS message. Um, it's a bit of an iceberg. It looks like it's only 10 lines long. That last line, get treatment processor, rendered treatment sets, that's where the bulk of the code is. There's a whole bunch of code behind there that gets shared. But what this demonstrates is this is a Java lambda that's using a library. There are three lambdas in our system that are about this size that use the same library. Uh, it's easy to have an engineer go off and write a fourth lambda that uses the same library in a slightly different way. And they're like, you can write them like Lego bricks that you can then plug in. So the service that we wrote, we called the on-demand image service, or ODIS. Uh, I'm going to go through basic principles how it works, then I'm going to go through in detail the, each of the lambdas and what they do. Basic principles. Owners will upload an image that came off their SLR. It might be 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. It could be 12 megabytes. These days, it could be 10,000 pixels wide. That's a huge image to be manipulating. If you're going to be uh, going back and using that image over and over again and producing different sizes of images, that's a large image. So we want to keep that one for the long term, but we're not going to use that as our primary image uh, for each of the manipulations we do. What we do instead, that image gets put in an S3 bucket. We run a lambda on that, which creates a master image. And the master image is about a quarter of the size of that original image. It's much smaller to load into memory. It's much smaller to manipulate uh, so faster. That master image is stored in an S3 bucket. And from that, we use another lambda to derive all of the different treatments that we serve up to the public. So now I'm going to go through step by step and build up the architecture of ODIS. At its core, there are three S3 buckets. One uh, on the far left is for the original images, one in the middle for the master images, and the one on the right is for the treatments that we serve up to the public. Initially, we were going to write uh, a service, a web service that people could upload images to. Uh, this is not the public uploading to it. This is our uh, business platforms, whether it's homeway.com or bedandbreakfast.com, they would be uploading images to a service that put them into S3. And then we realized that was really a waste of time. Why, why don't we have our business platform just upload directly to S3? So that's what we've done. We, we've cut out the middleman there, and we've saved some latency in that process. So it uses the S3 APIs to put the image into the original bucket. And along with the image, attach some metadata, which is a feature that S3 supports. You put the binary file in as an object into S3 and attach some named values as, as metadata. And that metadata helps to influence how Otis will treat that image. The creation of that S3 object triggers a lambda. And the lambda is given the, the key for that, that image file. The, uh, we call this lambda the induction lambda because it's inducting the image into our Otis system. It reads the file out of S3, processes it into the smaller master file, and writes it into the master S3 bucket. Uh, then it writes the metadata that it received from the client, gets written into a DynamoDB database, along with a signature for the image. And so there's a key for the image. And there's a signature. The signature is the MD5 hash that S3 happens to give us, which is nice. That saves us the time of doing it. Uh, the length of the file and the type of the file. So the MD5 hash plus the length of the file plus the type of the file, that's, that's pretty much guaranteed to be unique. Uh, and that gives us a unique signature for that file, which gets written into DynamoDB. A secondary function of the induction lambda is to watch out for duplicate images. 
we have some property managers who have thousands of properties that they advertise on our site, and they upload the image, they refresh their images three times a week, and they upload the same images three times a week, and they are supposed to give us a unique ID that is the same each time, but they don't. They give us a different ID each time. So they're uploading the duplicate image over and over again. Um, that signature that I talked about allows the induction lambda to detect, oh, I've already seen that one. It's already listed in the DynamoDB database. I don't need to, to process that one again. In fact, I'll delete it from the original bucket. I'll change the record in DynamoDB to point to the other copy of this image that we've already got. So we'll still process it as if it was a new image, but we haven't kept a, a duplicate copy of a 10 megabyte image lying around. There's a stream coming out of DynamoDB. So DynamoDB supports streaming. Um, every update, every record written to DynamoDB can be written into a stream, and you can have a lambda invoked in response to that stream. Uh, so we have uh, what we call the uh, disposition stream lambda that is listening to that stream. It could do some processing on the image, but it's not a good place to do that processing. Uh, the streams, there are only going to be a limited number of streams coming out of DynamoDB. It, it will shard the streams according to how many partitions you have in your Dynamo database. So when you start out and your Dynamo database is small, you might only have a single shard to that stream. So there'll only ever be a single one of the disposition stream lambdas running. Today, we've got a much larger database, and we've got several of them running. But there'll only ever be one, two, three, four of these running at a time. And they'll be given 10 records, 20 records, 100 records in a batch. Now, if you spend three seconds processing each one of those records, then that lambda becomes a bottleneck. So you don't want to do any heavy processing on your DynamoDB stream. You need to do a fan out from that. And the way we do the fan out is using SNS. So the disposition stream lambda, for every record it gets out of the DynamoDB stream, writes an SNS message with the content of that record that describes the image. Then we have a third lambda, the treatment caching lambda, that is invoked by those SNS messages and goes, oh, uh, there's a new, file, a new master file for me to process. It's now my job to take that master file and produce all of the smaller images that are derived from it, the thumbnails, the, the medium-sized images, the large full bleed images. Which images we, we cache uh, depends on that metadata that we were given. So the, the client writes metadata that says, this is a name set of treatments that I want you to cache. That metadata runs through the pipeline, arrives at the treatment cache with the SNS mate message, and the treatment caching lambda then goes, oh, I know that I have got to produce these six, seven, eight, nine, ten different treatments in the final S3 bucket. I haven't shown here, but there is a second DynamoDB database that contains the treatment definitions. Those get loaded the first time a lambda is, the treatment cache lambda is invoked. It loads those from the Dynamo second table and caches those so that subsequent invocations of that instance of the lambda, it's already got the definitions of the treatments to write out. The last step in, in the basic process is how do you serve the images up to the CDN? And for that, we've got a regular web service. Uh, it's actually hosted in Docker, running in our Mesos Marathon cluster. Um, you could serve images straight out of S3, but then you have no flexibility about how the image is named. Uh, by having an origination service there, uh, that web service is able to read the request URL and interpret it. So we're able to support our legacy URLs that we have used for 10 or 15 years, and we're able to support new URLs which are much more flexible and allow our user interface designers to say, I want it this size, I want it this size, I want it rotated on its side. Um, that can all be defined inside the URL itself. Sometimes uh, the origination service will get a request for an image that it doesn't have that size already. Um, so it can, on the fly, invoke uh, in a synchronous call 
a third lambda, a single treatment lambda. This one just builds the one image size that you need. So if you know the image exists, but the size that you want isn't already cached, uh, the origination service is able to invoke the single treatment lambda to cache that. That was the basic Otis system that we had running um, just over a year ago. Uh, one of the great things about lambdas and, and this whole serverless architecture is the way that it's like putting Lego bricks together. And that when your product people come along or your customers come along and say, hey, we need a new feature, it's, it's pretty easy to add them. Uh, something that we needed to do pretty much straight away was you upload an image. You've all done this, I'm sure. You upload an image from your iPhone to some website or you send, want to send it as an email and you look at the image on the website and it's on its side. Um, the phone knew which way up it was or you knew which way up it was, but the website doesn't seem to know. So you need to tell the website to turn it around. So we need a mechanism to be able to say that image needs to be changed. And to do that, we have uh, a set of single uh, synchronous call lambdas that can modify the disposition of an image. They can update uh, the DynamoDB record that describes the image and cause it to change the orientation, change the crop. It's not quite true to say we update the DynamoDB record. We don't update it. Uh, we need the image to have a new ID so that uh, any CDN caching that has happened for that image already will be forgotten. So we write a new record for that image with a new disposition, the new rotation, the new crop, which causes a new set of images to be cached in the treatment cache bucket and with a different ID to the previous one. So now uh, the UI can ask for the image with a different ID and get it with the correct rotation. Uh, the business platform people were, oh, this is all great, it's working fine, except we don't know when you're ready. We've uploaded an image to you. How can, can you tell us when the image is, is ready for us to ask for? Um, we achieved that by just adding the induction lambda. As soon as the master image is written to the S3 bucket, as soon as the record is written into the DynamoDB database, the image could be requested from the front end. Um, so the induction lambda can write a message into a kinesis queue, which triggers another lambda, a callback lambda, with information on a webhook to call back on the business platform to say, the image is now ready. You can, you can tell the owner his image is up, uploaded and he can now display it. So we've got millions of images. We want to know things about those images. So we want to plug in another system that's going to do image recognition. We have this service called IRIS, Image Recognition and Inference Service. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it doesn't use lambdas, so it's not part of this, this topic. But it needs to know about every image that's on our system. We already have a lambda that knows about every image that's passing through our system. So we'll just have that lambda write to a kinesis topic, and then that kinesis topic is what drives the image recognition system. And what Iris does for us is things like uh, it looks for out-of-focus images, it looks for um, inappropriate images, it looks for what is this image? Oh, it, it's, it's a bathroom, it, it's a car, it's a swimming pool, um, stuff like that. That information is very useful to us. We can't use lambdas for that yet. Uh, it uses GPUs. And you don't get, lambdas are not yet available for GPUs. We've said to, to Amazon, hey, maybe you would like to provide GPU lambdas. Um, and they've gone, that's, that's a strange idea. Why would you do that? Well, um, the GPUs take about a hundredth of the time that a regular CPU server does to do the kind of image processing that Iris does. Iris would really benefit from the same scalability, flexibility that we have with Otis. But at 100 times the processing time, no, uh, it's not cost effective. If they were GPU lambdas, we, we'd probably buy them straight away. So just summing up there, the, the benefits that we got out of AWS serverless were uh, ultra fine grain scalability. Uh, it's event driven, very rapid development. I would guess that it, I don't know whether it took us half as long or took half as many people, but it's something like half. And, and you can vary that equation in which way you want. Uh, you can add twice as many people or half the time, whichever. Uh, 
the flexibility, being able to plug more Lego bricks on the side or rearrange those Lego bricks, um, that, that's great. We didn't have the option of step functions when we designed uh, Odis. I'm not sure that we would change our design right now, but step functions are something else to look at. I don't talk about it here, but they're interesting as a way of orchestrating lambdas, um, looking at the response of one lambda and, and choosing to invoke a different range of options after that. Just on S3 space, this, just using S3 instead of uh, our expensive NFS storage is going to be saving us in the order of $20,000 a month. Um, not having redundant servers lying around for those once a week peaks is going to save us money. Um, and it's hard to measure what the benefit is here, but not having to worry about server patches, not having to worry about server maintenance, um, do we need to upgrade the server to some newer hardware? It's just not our problem. Um, if we, if we need more memory, we just change the configuration of our AWS lambdas. So operationally, it's a lot easier for us to run. What are some of the things that we learned? Uh, one thing that Otis doesn't do, but a lot of people are beginning to do within uh, HomeAway and, and Expedia, uh, lambdas are very good at, uh, if you've got something that needs to run once an hour, or at 3 p.m. on Tuesday afternoon, you can write a cron script, a cron configuration, and run a lambda to match that cron timer. So it's very easy to have something that runs once an hour. And then you really don't care whether it's, uh, it, it's done in five milliseconds or, or, or two minutes. It's only running once an hour or once a day. It, it's a very good thing to do. It saves you having a dedicated server just for something that needs to be scheduled. Um, why didn't we use API Gateway, Amazon's API Gateway? Uh, we, we definitely looked at that for about 48 hours and then realized, oh, duh, uh, every Amazon API Gateway function is public. Um, so yes, it's a great way of invoking lambdas if you want all of your lambdas to be public. We didn't want them to be public, so we couldn't use it that way. Um, this is counterintuitive. Initially, we went, hey, to, to manipulate an image that's uh, 6,000 by 4,000 pixels, that, that's easy to do in, in a 500 megabyte lambda. Um, and that's cheaper, except that the only parameter you control when you configure a lambda is how much memory it gets. But CPU is allocated proportionally. If you double the amount of memory allocated to the lambda, you double the amount of CPU it gets. So it actually turned out that um, we saved money by increasing the amount of memory we configured for our lambdas. We didn't need that much memory, but the fact that it got more CPU power meant that the job ran in less time, and so we paid less money. Um, this isn't a problem for Otis, it's just something to be aware of. Otis lambdas are pretty big. Um, we've got graphics magic in as a binary is wrapped up inside the jar file that we deploy. When it first gets instantiated, that lambda has to be unpacked and move the graphics magic file into the right place on the file system so that graphics magic doesn't get confused. All that takes about 10 or 12 seconds the first time a lambda is invoked. Um, that's not a problem because lambdas stick around uh, for, they get invoked once. They get they'll get invoked again and again and again. Even if they're idle, they'll stick around for anywhere five to 20 minutes. As long as something comes along that needs it in that time, they'll get reused. If you have really, really spiky loads, like in the middle there, where you go from 60 to 2,000, and then straight back down to 60 again, then you're going to instantiate a whole bunch of lambdas one time only, and you're going to pay that instantiation cost. And it's not going to get amortized over subsequent calls. So you're going to pay for that instantiation time, that 12 seconds, you pay for that 12 seconds at the 12 times, 12 times 10, 100 milliseconds. Yeah, you pay that much for it. But that doesn't matter if it gets reused 50 times or 100 times or 1,000 times. If you only get used once, you're paying that instantiation cost 
uh, and not recouping it in subsequent calls. So it's just something to be aware about when you're looking at your traffic patterns and trying to assess whether lambdas are going to be a good fit. I'm going to contradict something on the Amazon FAQ for uh, lambdas. They actually say the opposite of this. So I'm going to contradict that, and then I'll explain they're right, and so are we. Um, there's a limit on the size of uh, a Lambda package. It can't be more than 50 megabytes. This was never a problem for Otis, because from the beginning, we, um, we used something called sh um, shading. Other teams that I've come across recently inside Expedia were hitting this 50 megabyte limit and weren't sure what to do. They were packing all of their dependencies into one big zip file and then trying to deploy that. And they were pulling in a lot of dependencies, and that was adding up to more than 50 megabytes. Um, both Maven and Gradle have something called Shade or Shadow that will build a fat jar that's got your code in it and all of the functions that you call, all of the objects that you, you're using from other libraries in that one fat jar, but only the classes that you're using. So if, if you're dependent on the Amazon S3 library, but you're only using one class or one function in that library, then shading will pull just that piece of code out of the Amazon library and put it into the fat jar it builds for you and leave the rest behind. So if you're butting up against the 50 megabyte limit, you should be using shading. Now, the, the Amazon fax says the reverse. It says it's faster to unpack if you zip the jar file, your dependencies up in a lib directory. Um, that will be faster than building one big jar file. And, and both is correct. Um, they're correct that unpacking that zip file and leaving the jars as they are, rather than unpacking hundreds of individual class files, can be faster. But that's no good if, if your package ends up being over 50 megabytes, you're screwed. So you're going to have to do shading. Otis uses shading. We end up with a, about a 10 megabyte, 12 megabyte jar file, which includes graphics magic. Um, one project to rule them all. This, this is definitely something we've seen with other Expedia teams not doing and wishing they had. Uh, all of our lambdas are in one GitHub project, uh, one set of libraries building one jar file. Um, you can deploy that jar file multiple times specifying different classes within that jar file as the target for the lambda. It makes it much easier to have a single jar file that's deployed five times for five different lambdas than five separate projects that need to be coordinated and version controlled across them. Um, one of the Expedia teams I was talking to had something like 20 uh, different uh, JavaScript functions in 20 different projects. And they were getting confused about which, whether they had the right set of functions deployed that were compatible with each other. So keeping them all together in one project is a good idea. Um, this, is, this is a personal stupidity. Um, I talked about uh, our duplicate image detection. Um, this is me getting that wrong. So our duplicate image detection finds, oh, look, an, uh, a property manager has uploaded the same image for the fifth time this week. Let's not keep a copy of that. We'll delete that original image. This is a, a chart, an S3 object count chart for the last year for the master bucket. Um, that was the, the ramp up during uh, migration from our Austin data center into Otis in October of last year, uh, leading to currently, well, actually, as of about a month ago, 82 million master images. But if you look at the object count in our original bucket, it's 193 million images. And what's up with that? Because we're supposed to be deleting originals. Well, about a month after we wrote the code that deleted the duplicate images, somebody had the bright idea, which was a good idea, that said, our original images are really precious. We need to make sure that we don't screw up. Let's turn on S3 versioning. So we did turn on S3 versioning. Uh, and we didn't notice this until I did a first set of these slides for internal use back in March. And I look at this chart and go, that's not right. Um, so for, for a year, we were um, 
thinking we were deleting the duplicates, but actually we were just soft deleting them and they're still there. We have now turned that off and we're now, well, we haven't turned off versioning, but we're now explicitly deleting the version and so we're getting rid of the file. We haven't had the courage to go back and write code that will delete all of the duplicates because if we get that code wrong, so we're just going to leave them there. Um, there's an account-wide limit on the number of lambdas that you can run concurrently. Uh, the limit is per region. Uh, it defaults to 1,000. When we started two years ago, the default was 100, which, which is not enough to sneeze at. Um, HomeAway is currently running at 1,500. I believe the, the person that was speaking earlier was talking about having 2,000. You can go to Amazon and say, hey, I, we need more, and they'll increase it. They just need to have a ballpark number of how many you're going to use. So we're at 1,500, but that's across the whole of the account. Um, what that can mean is, in a design like this, if you have a spike on one end of your system, we've got a sudden surge of activity on the induction lambda, we can starve our single image lambda. Um, now, that's, that's not actually likely to happen. Much more likely is that you didn't realize it, but another team has realized that lambdas are really great, so they, another team is now using lambdas in the same account. You didn't know, they didn't tell you, and they're not very disciplined in the way they've done it, so they're spiking their lambda count all over the place, and you're looking at your system going, why is my performance bad? Why am I not spawning new lambdas? Well, it's because somebody else is taking them all. Um, fingers crossed this will change. I'll say no more. Um, I mentioned earlier that stream processing is a bottleneck. Uh, if you do any real processing in the stream handling lambdas, you are going to have a backlog building up behind you. So you want to get a record and do something with it really quickly, like spin it off into Kinesis or fire it off into SNS as we're doing. Kinesis has the advantage that it um, you can control how it's sharded. You have no control how many shards there are in DynamoDB streaming. You can control with Kinesis how many shards. So you can say, I want 50 shards on my Kinesis thing. And so you know that you can scale it up 50 times. Um, SNS has the advantage that there's no limit. You, you can fire off 100, 200 at a time. The disadvantage of SNS is there's not the guarantee of delivery that Kinesis gives you. Um, we didn't mind SNS because if we failed to deliver a message, if a message didn't get processed, that's okay. The single treatment lambda will handle it when somebody asks for that image. So you need to look at your use case, but um, try and do some kind of fan out from your stream processing, la processing lambdas. Um, testing and diagnostics. Uh, printf is back in a big way for diagnostics. It seems to come back every five years. Um, unit test and functional test thoroughly. Uh, I like to get to 95% line coverage with unit tests, and I don't feel comfortable until I'm there. But it's really hard to figure out what's going wrong when it's in production, when it's a lambda. You can't hook a debugger up to it. So try and find the bugs before it gets to production. Um, there's a product called Serverless that's, that's worth playing with that will let you run your code locally. Uh, Amazon has uh, SAM Local, which lets you run lambdas locally on your laptop and connect to your S3 re resources, connect to Kinesis or whatever. So you can there connect a debugger to it and see what's going on. Log generously. Um, it, it's a little unfortunate, but every Lambda ends up with its own file in CloudWatch. So if you've got hundreds of Lambdas being spun up and run concurrently, you will have hundreds of CloudWatch streams to, to aggregate. Homeway uses Splunk, so we aggregate all of that down into one, one stream that we can look at. Um, but the more logging you have, then the more chance you have of finding out what's going wrong. Um, there are newer products that we haven't really tried yet, but, but you should consider uh, Amazon X-Ray, AWS X-Ray is uh, a way of instrumenting 
Amazon's infrastructure as well as your own code to tell you what's going on. So that will give you information about um, this S3 object was created, a lambda was invoked, the lambda succeeded. All of that data gets captured by X-ray, and that may give you a lot more information than just your logging along, alone. Um, IO Pipe is a third-party product. I think it integrates with X-Ray. I, I also think it's only for JavaScript, but, but those are worth looking at as ways of getting more information about what's happening inside your lambdas. When you've got 500 lambdas running concurrently and they're processing lots of files, it's, if something is going wrong in a tiny fraction of 1% of those, it's pretty hard to figure out what's going wrong without having as many of these diagnostic tools as possible. Um, this is from a week. These, these are timeout counts, lambdas that timed out. This was a week during our early migration. Uh, were, in the week, we processed millions of files and we had 290 timeouts. We have no idea why they happened. Um, I've got theories about why they happened. Uh, it could have been that uh, the sharding of our uh, DynamoDB database, the partitioning of the DynamoDB database was changing as we were growing from a million records to 10 million to 20 million. I, I don't know what the problem was. Uh, just expect that things will go wrong that you didn't plan for. Um, something that was been introduced in the last year or so is dead letter queues. We didn't have this when Otis first went out, but there, there are they exist now, and you should use them. Dead letter queue, if, if you send, uh, if a lambda gets invoked and fails, uh, Amazon will try it again twice. So you'll get three, three attempts. If it fails the third attempt, and you've configured a dead letter queue, then a message will get written to the dead letter queue. And you can come and process that later. You can have a lambda that's listening to that. You could have a lambda post a message to uh, pager duty or whatever. But if you don't have the dead letter queue set up, then without crawling through your logs, you won't even know that something went wrong. So the dead letter queues are the way to find out something went wrong and potentially give you the chance to automatically remediate it. Um, we had some stuttering performance with DynamoDB streams early on. I'm pretty sure that was to do with the fact that we hadn't configured our capacity correctly, uh, the unit capacity. Um, that's easier to do today with auto-scaling. Auto-scaling didn't exist at, at the early on. We worked around it by having the induction lambda write the SNS notifications itself, instead of depending on the DynamoDB stream. Um, that didn't feel very nice, but we did it. Uh, today, we're going back to using the DynamoDB stream lambda. Um, we're now happy things have calmed down, and we understand what's going on better, and uh, our, our partitions are not changing anymore. So uh, to finish up with, uh, the technical is over. Um, this is more about humans. Uh, Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park, when he's told there's no problem with the dinosaurs breeding because they're all female, and he says something to the effect of nature will find a way. Well, customers will always find a way to, to surprise you. If your user experience design isn't great, then customers are going to trip you up. Four years ago, before Otis was written, we went to our customer base and said, uh, from now on, you've got to upload 19 by 20, 1920 pixel wide images. Many of our customers are in their 50s, like me. Unlike me, they're not very comfortable with computers. So how do they, how do they get a 1920 wide image? Um, ignore the white block. I'll explain the white block in a moment. Uh, you might not be able to see from the back, but um, you can perhaps see the X in the top right-hand corner there. This is where somebody didn't know how to take an image and enlarge it, so they put the photograph they already had up on their screen and photographed their screen. <laughs> now, the white block is a different kind of problem that I hadn't even noticed myself, uh, but the Amazon vetting process for the slides went, oh, you can't show that, that's a nude woman. <laughs> uh, so there was actually a painting of a, new, a pregnant nude woman there. It's semi-abstract, so... Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> 
We have had people uploading photographs of uh, hot tubs with nude people in them, and that doesn't, that contravenes our policies too. Um, another thing that we did was uh, when you're onboarding a brand new listing, uh, we, we have this wizard that makes it easy for you. We fixed this now, but uh, a couple of years ago, we had this wizard that made it easy for you. But you couldn't get past step three. Step three was upload your photos. You couldn't get to step four until you'd uploaded at least six 19 by 20, 1920 wide pixel images. Well, you've got people that, I just want to find out how this works. I need to get past this, so I'll upload the first six images I have available on my phone, like the fender bender I had this morning. <laughs> the insurance photograph I took. So yeah, humans will always find a way, even if your software is perfect, if your user experience is less than perfect, which it always is, then uh, humans will surprise you. So to sum up, lambdas are, are really great for event-driven systems, for highly elastic, highly scalable loads, uh, and for scheduled activities. I really do think that uh, development of Otis took about half the time it would have done if we had written a traditional collection of large Java application servers. Uh, and it's highly extensible. It doesn't fit every need. Um, so you want to think about what the costs are going to be. You want to try and do some modeling and figure out, is it really going to be cost effective for us to use lambdas? It's hard to assess because it's hard. there are some intangibles around operational costs, but uh, lambdas are not right for every purpose. Um, always look at DynamoDB auto-scaling. That would have saved us a lot of pain earlier on if it had been available at the time. Um, unit test thoroughly. Um, consider using X-Ray. And always use the dead letter queues. That is everything that I have to say. Um, I can take questions if there are any.